However, we can just use the SPEs to decrypt the code. So Sony's idea is, yeah, they can't see our code, so they can't fi find bugs in there. Well, as soon as we have PowerPC access, we can just ask the SPU to nicely decrypt stuff for us, and it will do so. It does not do any checks on what actually asks you to decrypt, to decrypt things. So with this, we just use asbestos and some, this NetRPC thing, write some Python scripts on the PC, and use it to like decrypt application selves or level two, or like just about every, we can de de decrypt just about everything now by just asking it to do it. So we don't even need to know how it works. We just have to ask it to do it for us. But, so yeah, the obfuscation <laughs> is useless. But we event <laughs> <laughs> So, but we still want keys. But let's first ta take, take a look at our table again, what we did now. So we have the security code processor there. It's pointless. So, and let's go one step back to the train of trust I showed at the beginning. So here we have it again, and I'm not going to explain the, so and on the left you just see what is run in chrono chronological order, and on the right you see the usage, and there are two things there which they can't update. It's bootloader and medloader. So bootloader is the very first thing that runs and just, um, yeah, it's just the very first thing that runs, and a meta loader is used to, um, it's used to lo load isolated SPU binaries, so they can't update that because it's encrypted with a console specific key. And yeah, the rest can all, they can update all the other things. And they don't want us to downgrade. So they added some revocation. The, you get the revocation list, they are, they are stored on the NOR on end flash as well. And the loaders verify if you try to load some binary, is this on a revocation list? And if it is, it will just ref refuse to boot. So the stuff at the top, it cannot be revoked because the previous loaders do not support any kind of revocation lists, so Sony did something else there. So first, it reads bootloader, LV, LV0, metloader, LV, LV1 loader, and LV1 from the, from the NAND, or from the NOR on your PS3s, and just runs them. And then once LV1 runs, it loads all that stuff again to verify it. So you can just remove the NOR, plug in a mod chip in there, so when it's read first, you supply your downgraded um, version. Then when the PS3 reads it for the second time, you supply the real version it's supposed to run, and it will just run because it thinks uh, like, yeah, I am running the current version, so I can just continue to boot. And this allows us to like downgrade everything because we can just downgrade the revocation list as well. So the revocation is useless. It's just some kind of specification thing. There's no revocation there. So as soon as we break one loader, we break it forever. We can forever own all PS3s out there. So we need to do that. <laughs> so here we have lo the local storage again. It's an isolated mode, so you can't access the red stuff. Only the SPU itself can do that. But you can access the green stuff, and you need to supply a revocation list. So this list is, of course, signed and encrypted. So they have to copy it to the, um, to the pr protected part, because they don't want you if they would decrypt it in place and check the signature in place, you could just like wait for it to do that and then at the right time write some PowerPC code to modify it. So they really have to copy it. And here's how they do that. So what's wrong here? The problem is that we have the destination buffer lies before LV2 load our code. The SOAR buffer, so we control the source and we control the length of the source. So what if we just write some really, really huge value there? Well, we overwrite LV2 loader code and run code in isolated SPU mode. Then we can just go ahead and dump their keys. Just write something to pu push them over to the power PC and then, yeah. Then we can actually reverse the whole loader and we get some keys there. So what are the implications of this? So it's only a bug in one isolated loader. However, if we put such a modified uh, revocation list onto the um, NOR flash, the hypervisor will just load it. It does not care about the size, and that, co that code actually works, and we'll just supply a really huge revocation list to uh, like LV2 loader. Then we patch LV2 loader to ignore signatures, and well, we get our code running at boot time without any kind of dongles or stuff. And this breaks the chain of trust pretty early.
So as you can see there, this is fail. But we promised epic fail, so we'll have to look further. <laughs> so let's go back to the table. Well, the chain of trust is broken. And back to the selves. We now like how just about everything works here, except for the signature part. So how do they do that? How does the signature thing work? So this is ECDSA and it's some crazy math stuff that guy over there is going to explain now. <laughs> Hi. Okay, so the thing we're trying to do is figure out a private key they use to, to put signature on all the files. Uh, you normally cannot do that, of course, that's why it's a good quick app system. Uh, uh, in ECDSA, there's a lot of parameters that are public, the P, A, B, G, N, Q, E, R, S, whatever. Uh, but there are two things that are private uh, in, a si in a single signature. That's K, the private key, which we want to have. And it's M, which is supposed to be a random number. Okay, next slide. Okay, so how does someone who signs something calculate uh, the numbers R and S, which are the signature? Well, R is done by, uh, by scalar multiplication of the base point of the elliptic curve, blah, 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 difficult stuff. It's the difficult problem that, uh, uh, that's the base of uh, the security of all elliptic curve crypto. Uh, but S is just calculated as normal numbers. Um, well, so that, uh, uh, that first equation uh, we cannot solve. No one in the world can solve it. So let's just ignore it. But the second equation, uh, it's, it's got two unknowns in it now, K and M. So we cannot solve for it either. But M is supposed to be a random number. And for some reason, Sony uses the same random number all the time. <laughs> So, so there at the top are, is, uh, are the two equations again, but twice now, like we have two, uh, two separate signatures. Uh, we're going to ignore that top one again because it's difficult, right? Uh, but now at uh, 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 the equation for S1 and S2, uh, we still have only two unknowns because it's the same M. It's supposed to be a different M every time. Then we've got three unknowns, only two equations. No way to solve it. But now we've got uh, only two announced. So uh, it's, it's trivial to just solve for M by just, uh, uh, you take the two, uh, the, uh, the two formulas, subtract them, um, whatever, just a bit of formula manipulation. And then you solve M, and then you've got M, and just fill it in, and then you solve for K. So we've, we've got a private key without, uh, without even having to know most of, uh, most of the curve parameters and anything. So th we actually used ECDSA in the Homebrew Channel's uh, network update functions so that someone can't own your Wii through a man-in-the-middle attack or something. So this is how we do it, right? We do the EC mat. You can see the M times EG, blah, 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 stuff there. And for M, we read cryptographically secure random numbers from devrandom on Linux. Uh, you know, that's what you're supposed to do and what Sony does is, well... And of course, as uh, Sekhar explained, if you use the same M, you can calculate K once you have two signatures. And if you have K, well, that's a private key. And with a private key, you can sign things. <laughs> so these signatures are every bit as valid as Sony's official signatures. They are indistinguishable. And uh, we, can, we, we can get keys for LV2, we can get keys for LV1, we can get keys for uh, revocation lists, we can get keys for uh, hypervisor configuration files, which is interesting, and for packages and a whole bunch of stuff. So um, We actually don't have keys for level one because sorry, yeah. we can't run that loader because it does weird hardware stuff, so we still have to figure that out. Yeah, sorry. So in fact, you can get the keys if you have the, um, 
plain text for all the loaders, but right now Sony's security for the few loaders that uh, haven't been dumped yet hinges on just the AES stuff that we don't have and the per console key, but everything that you need to get these keys is, ins is inside a PS3, you just have to get to it. So back to the table here, well, <laughs> they botched the public key crypto, so that's a big fail. And we're left with user kernel mode within the on die boot room, which are not exactly high tech security features. So, pretty much botched the entire thing. So, thanks, Sony. <laughs> All right. All right, thank you. Coming soon. <laughs> Looks like we might have a little bit of time for questions for Q and A. We're actually going to try to do a demo of this, and we were going to do it now, but as usual, demos are late or don't work. Uh, in fact, we have video issues the same way we had video issues with the Bootme demo uh, two years ago. So we're going to try to fix that, and we're trying to schedule a lightning talk tomorrow to uh, get that uh, presented. So if you have any questions, we have two microphones on the left and on the right. Please line up. And if you're afraid of asking questions in public, the people are down at the Hex Center. I got a question. Um, do you know where the PS jailbreak came from? Not a clue. <laughs> Seriously, not a clue. We, we can guess, but we, you know, we don't have any proof of absolutely anything. Um, we think it's somewhere from the southern hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, right now, um, I noticed that the, uh, not only the um, exploits, but uh, the USB stack exploit, but also the, the, the payload has been completely reverse engineered. So uh, there are, there's source code available right now uh, for everything? Yeah, the, well, right now, Asbestos is public, ha has been for a while. It contains an implementation of the USB exploit that runs on uh, TI OMAP processors. There are a whole bunch of uh, clones for other chips. And of course, there's also a reverse engineered payload for that if you want to replicate the original PS uh, jailbreak functionality instead of running Linux. That's out there right now. Our stuff, uh, we, well, we did some pretty terrible hacks to make it work for the demo, hopefully tomorrow. So we need to clean things up and make it saner. But I mean, I expect this in the next month or something like that, we'll uh, release clean tools for the stuff we did, that we did here. Thank you. Okay, a uh, question from the RFC. Um, now that you can sign your own code, why can't you create a Blu-ray software payload? Could you repeat that? Someone asked, um, now that you can sign your own code, why can't you create a Blu-ray software payload? So we actually don't have the key to sign uh, games because that's app loader and uh, they changed those keys uh, several times. Actually, no, they didn't change those keys, but we don't have it. Because we, we, we don't have an exploit in app loader, sorry. Uh, so yeah, well, you need the plain text of the loader to get the public key and once you have the public key then, yeah. So we can't sign games and also we don't really care about games because we care about low level access. It, it's probably possible eventually, but we're not planning on working on it. Yeah. So, any more questions? No? So, if you leave the room, please go to the right, pick all the trash which, which is around you, and everything that's valuable, please put to the lost and found. Thank you. <laughs>